Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a little bit of prayer? And dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have here today uh, to open your word and to continue um, examining the, these verses in Daniel chapter 11 and to understand them. We ask for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, give us the ability to concentrate, to understand these things, and uh, to correct us when we are in error. Um, forgive us our sins and help us to trust in you in all things. Be with each person studying these truths. May you work in their lives. May your angels watch over them. And may you give light for their feet. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, now, I've just been spending quite a bit of time going through these numbers. Um, that is, with each of these, so just as a review. So what we've done here in Daniel chapter 11 is we have taken this history of Alexander and we have paired it up with 1989 particularly the standing up of Alexander. We look at what happened with the Soviet Union in the Afghan war. So that's going to be from December 24th, 1979 to uh, February 15th, 1989. So that's when uh, that is going to, to end, right? That's that the war ends. Now this is um, about what, 25 days um, 26 days from when, uh, 25 days from when George Bush, the first, George, uh, Bush senior takes office, right? So, so we have, um, that war ending. Um, and then in 1989, obviously November 9th is going to be the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union, with the Berlin Wall coming down. And then 777 days later, um, we're going to have uh, Mikhail Gorbachev resign. So that's December 26th, 1991. So we have we have these dates here um, established that that that's part of this line. That's how we've 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 looked at this. Now it's going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven, and so. We looked at some of the symbols here of these Hebrew numbers. Now, this is something we did, of course, in the book of Judges. Um, we took Hebrew numbers. So these are arbitrary numbers to some degree uh, attached to the definitions that Strong has given in his concordance. So they're called Strong's numbers. He has Hebrew and Greek numbers. And, um, you know, if somebody else had done the dictionary, the numbers would have been different. So, so the numbers are a sense arbitrary, just as the verse divisions are arbitrary. There's something created by man. Somebody's gone through and made a choice on how they're going to divide the Bible into chapters and verses. Yet God uses these things as symbols. So we can look at a verse like uh, Daniel 9:11, and we can say, well, that's significant, right? Uh, many other verses that we've looked at. Um, but looking at a Hebrew number, then we, we would say that it re refers to days, sometimes other portions of time, but usually we just apply it to days. So if you have, um, uh, uh, you know, for instance, if we take the four winds of heaven and we add 702 plus 7307 plus 8064 and you add them together, you get, um, if I remember correctly, it was like, what was the number? About 16,073. And that happens to be the number of days from the start of that Afghan-Soviet war on December 24th, 1979, to that December 25th, 2023 date that we had already placed on our lines because of other numbers. Um, that is, the word years spans from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, 2023. So the word years 
H141 is the number of days inclusive from September 11th or 9-11 to December 25th, 2023. So we have all of these different types of symbols that we can say, well, they definitely fit this line. So these would be a very strong witness that this line is correct. And so we have other ones as well. So um, so having these uh, things like the end of years, if we add that together, 7093, that's Daniel 11, verse 6, and 8141, you add those together, those are going to give you the span of time from uh, the first full day that George Bush Sr. had in office, that is uh, January 21st, 1989, so the end of that day, to the beginning of the Day of Atonement in 2030. So that's another way mark that we've had on our lines, uh, that Day of Atonement in 2030, as well as um, the first day of the seventh month in 2030, as well as the first day of the first month in 2030. All of those have been marked um, in the Book of Judges when we, we did that. So... So it seems kind of remarkable that we have this happening if we are not correct in in our understanding of of these passages. So what we we have tried to to settle on is we know that we're going to start um, in verse three with um, Alexander, and we're going to say that his standing up. That's 5975. Now, it's not the only standing up that happens. That is, that word shows up as we go through this, these verses here. You're going to see it in verse 6. Uh, Neither shall he stand, nor his arm. So you're going to see that number 5975. And we, on the chart that we had, uh, that's the number of days from 9-11 to um, January 20th, 2018. So it shows up there. Now that means, uh, you know, we, we can take that number 5975 and we can say, well, it's a symbol, um, that, that we can apply in, in our lines, but it shows up in other verses. So that's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of, are we being arbitrary in what we're doing here? So, so Angela, it makes a comment, you know, 8441. Would remind us of Daniel 8, 14, the end of the 2300 years and the sanctuary cleansing begin on October 22nd, 1844. So, yeah, so that's possible there, too. Um, uh, but we have these numbers and sometimes we have the same digits, but in a different order. So we've had ones where we take um, um this, uh, which was 4438, his kingdom, the word kingdom. And that's the number of days from um, beginning of the Afghan war to uh, December 25th, 1991. If we reorder the digits instead of 4438, it's 4384. So we just arrange those digits. And we had other ones as well that we could arrange. And so the question is, well, is that, is that valid? Can we just rearrange the dates? Um, we have same with according to his dominion. So we have kingdom and dominion, those two different types of words. And both of those can be rearranged. The 4915 can refer to uh, the end of the Afghan war to September 11th. That's uh, 4591 days. And so we have all of these different arrangements of numbers. Um, so what we were looking at yesterday, though, had to do with uh, verse 6, 7, and 8. So that was really where our discussion was centered on. So we know in verse 6, um, we, we try to find who this is referring to in our time. And in order to do that, we need to understand the history that this is explaining. Now, generally, we just go to um, uh, Uriah Smith and... Uh, um, so uh, that's usually the 
where we go. And I'm trying to find this other source here. Just hang on. set up here. Now, um, I'm just going to look at this other book that's going to give us a bit of history. This is Tidings Out of the Northeast by Swearingen, Swearingen, Mark Alden Swearingen, Swearingen, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. And uh, so we're just going to look at what he says here. So this is a book, Tidings Out of the Northeast. And um, he's going to go through uh, lots of things. He's going to go through Daniel 12. He's, he actually does a lot of the same things that we do, going through the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, so let's see if I can find this here. Um, just going to look at the table of contents and find this page. Okay, so let's continue. So we can start. If these pages match. Okay. Um, so, it, so he's going to deal with this uh, starting at verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong in one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion, and in the end of years they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. So when we were looking at this verse, we have to say, well, how do we apply this verse historically? First, we're not going to just directly take this verse and interpret it in our time. We have to know the historical uh, fulfillment. So he says, the king of the south shall be strong in one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion, his dominion shall be a great dominion. Using Judeo-Palestine as the point of directional reference, Hellenistic Egypt would be symbolized as the king of the south, its first king, Ptolemy I Soter. One distinction in the Persian campaign against Alexander the Great, having served as one of Alexander's seven bodyguards and his personal historian, and I said against, but it's under Alexander the Great, Ptolemy was one of the ablest and wisest generals of the entire Greco-Macedonian army. He foresaw that Egypt would have great possibilities because of its isolated location from the potential hostilities that could arise between the other rival generals. At his request, he was appointed satrap of Egypt by Perdiccas, Alexander's former chief cavalry officer, and Philip III Arahadius, one of Alexander's successors who both oversaw the division of the empire after Alexander's death. Having established his reign without opposition, Ptolemy found that Egypt was easy to protect from invasion and possessed excellent natural defenses. He would easily consolidate his rule in this country of the Nile, becoming strong from the beginning of his appointment as satrap. And particular, this particular dynasty would survive the longest out of all the Hellenistic monarchies, so from 323 to 30 BC. Ptolemy had initially desired to greatly enhance Egyptian prestige by seizing the body of Alexander. Perdiccas had actually planned to have Alexander's body laid to rest with the house of the royal nobility in Macedonia. He had entrusted its transport to Philip III, who would take it from Babylon to Macedonia. Ptolemy, however, had other plans and would meet the young regent at Damascus, Syria, where he would convince Philip to allow Alexander's body 
to be transported first to Memphis in Egypt to await a permanent burial later at Alexandria. Perdiccas was enraged at this event and responded by declaring war on Ptolemy. As it turned out, Perdiccas was brutally murdered in a conspiracy after an attempted three separate invasions of Egypt that proved unsuccessful in 320. His own officers were among the conspirators and the murderous entourage would be led by an ambitious former general of Alexander named Seleucus, who would later become the first Seleucid Syrian king, Seleucus I Nicator. Okay, so, so we can see this history. It's just giving us some more details about what was happening. Um, um, so you're going to see that there's going to be this, uh, this, um, the king of the north and the king of the south, basically, uh, fighting each other. During the original breakup of Alexander's empire in 323 BC, Seleucus was not given a territorial appointment, but would later become the satrap of Babylon in 321 BC. Yet, the growing power of Antigonus, the one-eyed, and his son Demetrius would force him to flee to Ptolemy for protection. Placing himself under Ptolemy's command, Seleucus became one of Ptolemy's princes, receiving a commission as the commander of the Egyptian naval forces. He would later defeat Demetrius at Gaza, which would allow Seleucus to return to Babylon. He eventually joined a military coalition with Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy against Antigonus and Demetrius, and would make a substantial contribution to the defeat and death of Antigonus in the Battle of Ipsus. So we've heard about this before in 301 BC. Seleucus and Lysimachus had actually gained the most territory after the Battle of Ipsus, which later led to a showdown between these two former generals in the Battle of Corrup Corrupidium, Corrupidium in 281. After Lysimachus was defeated and killed, Seleucus emerged as the most powerful king with the largest territory of all the former generals of Alexander. He would become more powerful than his former ally Ptolemy, strong above him, having great dominion as the greatest king of all of Alexander's successors. The contention that Ptolemy the Ptolemy I and Seleucus I would have over Coal Syria had its original sh origin shortly after the death of Alexander. Ptolemy was originally awarded this region and would occupy it during the defeat of Demetrius at Gaza. Yet as Seleucus I would grow more powerful, this coveted region became a strong source um, of contention because of its location and natural resources. Following Antigonus' defeat at Ipsus by the four generals, Ptolemy I occupied Col Syria once again, but Seleucus objected, contending that during the Battle of Ipsus, his Egyptian colleague had withdrawn his army after hearing a false rumor that Lysimachus had, de had been defeated. As a result, Ptolemy had provided no military support for the operation. Now, uh, this place here, um, I've, I've looked it up before. I can't remember the, the details. Um, what's going on? I can't. Um, It, it, the definition is hollow Syria, the area between Lebanon and anti-Lebanon, and, anti though it came to represent the stretch from the Orontes to the Dead Sea. Um, so this area uh, we would call, um, so you got, uh, it's basically north of Palestine. To, so it's just kind of uh, the middle of Syria, I guess. It's the southern part, right along the Arabian Desert. Um, it includes Damascus, but it's north of the land of Israel. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that, what we're talking about here. Now, any thoughts on what we've read so far? Because this is just the history. So they're going to fight over this, this area, Coal Syria. 
and it, it's going to be a, a battleground uh, for many different battles between the North and South. Okay, so, so there's going to be the five Syrian wars. So it says at the end of the years, they shall join themselves together. So after these, this period of time, which it's called the end of years, uh, this passage states that in the end of years, Egypt and Syria would reconcile their differences and join themselves together. Why is it called the end of years? Any, any thoughts on that? Why would, why would this period of time be referred to as the, in the end of years? Is that kind of I strange? To remind us that this is the end times, that, that this is referring, it's going to recur again in the end times, like just before Christ comes back. Okay. Um, Take a look also at your Hebrew in that. Yeah. So, when, yeah. I I was I was intrigued on on a couple of things after yesterday's study. Yeah. The first out of Daniel eleven five, because yeah. why, are they, why are they using two words for dominion? But then at the end of years in Daniel eleven six, the the word for years which may be common from the Hebrew. Is Hebrew eight one four one rearranged eighteen forty one? Okay. So is this? I mean, yeah. 18, <clears throat> we know that the the first and the second angel's message became prominent from eighteen forty to eighteen forty four. Yeah, eighteen forty one being right in that mix. Okay. Well, that's definitely possible. Um, now, you first, let's address, um, there's three different words translate, or two different words translated as dominion. So dominion right. occurs in verse 5. Right. The first okay. one, 4,910, uh, 4, uh, that just is the word mashal, which means to rule. And we're also going to see um, uh, this other word, 4915, which I'm just trying to find here. Um, As you got that rule, like in Daniel 11, verse 3, he shall stand up, that shall rule with great dominion. So the word rule and dominion are related words because you got mashal and all they do is they put a, another mim. That's the letter M in front of uh, mashal, right? So you have uh, the word mashal, which is mem, shin, lamed. And then they put a mim in front and a mim is just um, can often mean with. So, so it's just, we're translating it into English. They have a dominion. Um, but it's just basically a territory that's ruled by, by a ruler, by a mashal. So that's just his territory, his dominion. Um, and then we have, uh, in verse, uh, in verse four, we have the word dominion and it's the word mashal which means empire, that's 4915. So you have 4910, 4910, uh, which is uh, to uh, a rule, which is in this case a, um, uh, let me just go here, so that to rule is um, a verb, right? Where uh, the empire, Marshal is a dominion, um, and it means, uh, you know, so it's a noun. It's just a masculine noun. So these are different forms of the same word. And then even when you, right, so when you get to dominion, the mimshal, 
But again, it's just a different form of the same word. Now, some dictionaries would just say they're the same word, right? Like if we did it in English, we'd have a word and we would say, well, here it is as a noun. It's used this way. Um, and, you know, it has different uses. But in, in the Strong's Concordance, he's going to mark them out as different words, even though one just has a prefix added to it. It changes how it's it's spelled. So so that's why you have these different words for dominion. Right. So they're basically all the same word, just in a different form. Does that help with the dominion part there, Dwight? It helps a little bit. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> So then when we get to the end of years, well, that word end, case, we, we've seen that word many times when we were studying the book of Judges because it's a word that refers to a border, right? So so, the, so literally it'd be the border of years, the border of uh, Shana. Now, so, so one way is that we would look at a border of years is the point where a year changes, right? So, so the idea of the end of years is not the idea of, you know, the end of time. It's actually a border of years. So we have to decide why is it called this at this border of years, right? And, and that's not really clear in any of the the commentaries that I've read uh, to address this. So um, they just kind of seem to ignore it as is not significant. So um, let me see here if I can. Uh, now, the only one that really addresses it is um, Commentary says Keel and Dillich because they're pretty detailed. They just say after expiry of a course of years. So they're just saying, oh, just after some years, they shall join themselves together. That's how they interpret. But but it doesn't really say that, right? It it says at the border of years. Now now maybe that's an idiomatic expression. Just means in the passing of time. Right. So, so that is a possibility why it sends, says the end of years. But we've taken that period of time. If we count that 7093 and 8141, add them together, we get 16, uh, 15,234. So that's the number of days between uh, the first day in office of George Bush the first to the Day of Atonement in 2030. So. So it would it would deal with this whole span of time um, if we just take the Hebrew numbers there. But again, uh, how else could we understand this end of years? It's just an expiry of a course of years. You know, saying, well, time is just past. The passing of time. But we have other expressions which generally would be used uh in that sense. So any other any other ideas about what the end of years would mean? Because because I'm suggesting that it, it represents a, a time within the year. That is, if we look at the end of years, what kind of years do we have that we could mark the end of years? So what about sabbatical years, jubilee years? When does, it, when does a jubilee cycle end? Or when is it marked? Isn't it normally marked in the seventh month? Yeah, the tenth day of the seventh month. So if we say that um, we can go from um, uh, this date here, January twenty-first, 
and count to the Day of Atonement in 2030, so January 1st, 1989, and count this period of time, 15,234 days, and bringing us to um, uh, um, to the Day of Atonement in 2030. Well, that would be be interesting, right? So we would we would have to say that there's something there that needs to be noted. Okay, so we get to the Day of Atonement. We count from the end of George Bush's senior, his first day in office. We count that 15,234 days. It brings us to October 8th, which is the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030. So we've already marked this before <clears throat> when we were doing the Book of Judges. But if it's if it's a border of years... Um, could it refer to some kind of jubilee cycle in the history of that period? Possible. Okay. Now, when we're looking yeah. at this, um, there's there's a lot within this statement that in the end of years they shall join themselves together or mm -hmm. associate themselves right. so, so there's some kind of um, league that's being talked about here, right? Right. This is going to be a Berenice. They're going to try to make this union. Okay. So, as Treasury of Scripture knowledge would be pointing out, they were always applying it that there were wars between the father of Ptolemy the third and Antiochus Theos, the king of Syria. Okay. But it was under Ptolemy the third that he found that his sister, Berenike, had been murdered. Okay. So you you have quite a you know kind of a, a family drama that is being portrayed within this one verse. It's not just one king against another king, it's a couple of kings going against what could have been you know other members of the Seleucid Empire. Okay. So how do we reconcile all of that? Now, that's the question. I mean, so because this end of year is a border of years. So what they're saying is in the passing of time. But okay. is it possible that this is marking the beginning of a time that is the first end of years? Okay. Right? Because a border doesn't, is just something dividing something, Right. And when it comes to years, it, it could be dividing, you know, some kind of cycle of years, some kind of period of years. But I don't think it's just that these years have passed, that there is this period of time in which this is occurring. So it could be the first end. So we know when we get to, uh, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. 
launching, launching the Second Syrian War. Antiochus II sought to recover the territories during the First Syrian War, met with some success. Yet growing weary of continual conflict, the two kings would eventually join themselves together in peace in 252 BC, right? So you have the Second Syrian War. So could this 252 BC have something to do with this period of time that's going to end, right? That is the, the Second Syrian War. Is it something to do with that? Right. So that's when the king's daughter of the south came to the king of the north to make an agreement. To secure peace, Ptolemy II would offer his daughter Berenice in marriage to Antiochus II, which would include a lucrative dowry. The Seleucid king agreed to these terms and exiled his current wife, Laodice, and their two sons in the process. Right. So, but he shall, and we'll go into that verse later. So the fact that this happens in 252 BC, is that significant? Should we take note of it? Well, I would think so. Okay. So does that have anything to do with this period of time that's that's starting at this period that they call the end of years? Instead of looking at that as an end of years, but just the border of these years that's going to go to 252. But as it's leading us up to 252, the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. I don't know if people follow that. Because the question is, when do they join themselves together? Is it is it just with uh, the marriage of Berenice to the king of the north? Or is this talking about a whole period in which they're trying to join themselves together, even though there's these wars going on? Right. So with the end of years referred to 252 B.C., that's the question. Again, I think that's very possible. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so I, I want to finish off just reading what he says about this history, and then we'll go back to some other things. So about these verses. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, launching the second Syrian war, 261 to 252, and the II sought to recover the territories lost during the first Syrian war and met with some success, yet growing weary of continual conflict, the two kings would eventually join themselves together in peace in 252 BC. In this treaty, the king's daughter of the south came to the king of the north to make an agreement to secure peace. Ptolemy II would offer his daughter Berenice to marry uh, in marriage to Antiochus II, which would include a lucrative dowry. So we read that already, okay? And then we get here, but uh, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her and he that begat her, which we say um, that those whom she begat, and he that strengthened her in these times, humiliated by her former husband, Laodice exacted revenge by assassinating Antiochus II through poisoning in 246 BC. Thus the one who strengthened Berenice in those times did not stand. Having no protection, Berenice and her infant son were also eventually executed by Laodice, who would then have her own son proclaimed king, Seleucus II Callinicus. Therefore, having been given up, um, having been given up and murdered with they that brought her, her attendants, Berenice would not retain the power of the arm, and her infant son, he that begat her, literally, literally, whom she brought forth, 
uh, would also meet with the same fate, falling victim to the avenging wrath of the former Queen Laodice, which makes more sense than what we saw in um, uh, in uh, Uriah Smith's uh, interpretation. Anyway, but out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. And shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. That's the end of verse eight. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. Verse nine. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. Hearing that his sister was besieged by Laodice, Ptolemy the third, your Jutes, your, your, your Jutes, uh, the son of Ptolemy the second, a branch of Berenice's roots, launched the third Syrian war. So 246 to 240, also called the Laodicean war, marching against Syria while his sister was still alive. Having arrived too late to save the life of Berenice, Ptolemy III then desired to deal with, against them by coming with an army. He would ultimately prevail in this invasion into the fortress of the king of the north had uh, uh, had led to the greatest military victory over Seleucid Syria ever achieved by the Ptolemaic dynasty. He conquered many Syrian cities and would have completed the total conquest of the Syrian empire altogether had he not been forced to withdraw to Egypt. Uh, because of a homeland rebellion. Even so, Ptolemy III still returned to the land of the, of the Nile as a conquering king supporting the spoils of victory. Okay, so any thoughts about this section? So there are some things here that we need to, to recognize um, that now, what about this standing up in his estate and entering into the fortress of the king of the north? What have we made out of this verse in the past? I wish Stephen was here, but he's not. He knows quite a bit about this history. We've been making application with the globalists on this. Okay, but, uh, I'm just talking about historically. Okay. So, so we have something similar to this later in, in Daniel 11, right? Yes. Okay. So well, let's take a look at that. Um, so when it talks here about, uh, she'll stand up in his estate. Um, we're going to see this in, in Daniel 11. Verse 20, then she'll stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So what is this history? This is the history of Rome, right? That's the way we replied it. Okay. So, so we have this standing up in his estate. Now, the thing about the word estate is, is the number 3653 is actually 10 years, right? 365.25 is one year. So if you're going to round that up, it's going to be 365.3. And so 3653 three, is a period of 10 years. Does that make sense? It can be, yeah. So if you divide it by 365, you get 10 years. Uh, And you could say 
Um, yeah, so it, it's not even going to be a whole day. So it's 10 years. It's about as close as you could get to 10 years with uh, a four-digit number, right? So it's, it's going to give you 10 years. Um, okay, 11 first, 20 to the 211, Angela asks. Okay, well, I mean, it's possible. 11 verse 20, 211, I don't know. But just this, this word estate shows up in both of these. So we have this idea of this state standing up in his estate. So you get that 5975 and 5921. And then you have this estate, which is a period of 10 years. And we're going to see it in verse 21. And in this, this, this state, she'll stand up a vile person, right? So so we, we apply this to Trump. I mean, if we're going to make an application to our time, right? That's how Jeff applied it. <clears throat> and it's going to be uh, which emperor, if we look at it historically? Who is the vile person? Come on, you guys. So we know Augustus is the raiser of taxes, right? This is going to be Tiberius. Tiberius was the raiser of taxes, not Augustus. No, Augustus is the raiser of taxes. All right. It went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Okay. Right? right. And then Tiberius is the one that's going to uh, follow Augustus. Right. He's going to be this vile person. So that's how Jeff applied it. So the raiser of taxes is Obama, and the vile person is Trump. That's that's. I'm just saying that's how Jeff did it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so that and that's you know that's the way it's understood. Augustus and Tiberius in Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, right? So you can see that there. On the side here, right, we got the Tiberius follows Augustus. Um, and then you have here the raiser of taxes. Augustus, the raiser of taxes, appears. So, so you're going to have uh, the first emperor and the second emperor. But we're going to apply this to Obama and Trump. That's how I apply it. So now if we go back to 11 verse 7, and we've been addressing here, um, so one stands up in his estate. So in whose estate is this one standing up? Because now when we go back to our application of this, remember we had tied this to uh, uh, verse 2, you're going to have these kings, right? The kings of Persia. Now we go to verse 3. We're going to have, we're going to go back to 1989, right? And, and now we have Greece being as used as a symbol of our line. So that's that's how we, we looked at this. So the fall of the Soviet Union is paralleled here with the fall of Alexander's kingdom. And his kingdom is going to be broken. And this is going to happen to the Soviet Union, right? And, and we looked at these wars. So that's how we understood this so far. This is how we're making this application in this examination of these verses. Um, so now we have the king of the south is going to be 
the UN. The king of the north is going to be the United States, right? That's how we're looking at this. That's the way it's been applied, yes. And then we get to the end of years. They're going to join themselves together. Well, we're saying that this is this period of time in which this alliance is being formed. And so uh, we're saying that that's going to be 9-11. So the UN is strengthened, or at least it, they at this time, they're going to join themselves together with the United States. And this is going to be the king's daughter of the south that shall come to the king of the north. So the king's daughter would be a church, a religious philosophy, a belief that's going to be infiltrating Christianity in the United States. Right. We also parallel to the Adventist church as well as part of this at 9-11. So, so this is the agreement. This is this, um, this covenant that's being made. But she shall not retain the power of the arm. That is, the she has to refer to this daughter of the south, because that's historically what it is. Uh, neither shall he stand nor his arm. So who's the he here? Historically. So she's not going to retain the power of the arm. The UN um, is seeking to have this alliance with the United States. The globalists are. Which says she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm. But she shall be given up. And they um, or, or those whom she she uh, bore, right? She brought forth, right? Well, well, pardon me. They that brought her, and, and those whom she begat. That's that's how we look at that. And he that strengthened her in these times. So we have: she shall retain, not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up. And they that brought her. So we have to determine what that is. And those whom she begat, and he that strengthened her in these times. So that's kind of where we were at. We're saying, who is this? Who are these different characters? How would we apply that to our history? Do we just place this all in this history from 9-11 to where? Now, we could say that this is all about the Sunday law. But so that's the, that's part of the problem where we have is, are we placing this just at 9-11? Or is this covering the whole history of the Sunday law? I would almost think it covers the entire history of the Sunday law. Because when we're when we go forward after verse seven and we go into verse eight, we have I think additional evidence for this. Okay. Um, okay. Explain again. Explain how you're understanding this. Okay. I agree with you that with Daniel eleven seven that this can easily be examined in the light with Daniel 11.20. Now, okay. Daniel 11, from, from what we're looking at, from Daniel 11.6 to Daniel 11.8, I think we have a an overview of the entire period of the Sunday Law. Okay, and that's kind of what I think, right, that this is dealing with that Sunday law. Now, um, so 
what about entering into the fortress of the king of the north? What? Um, so if we look up this word fortress, it's going to show up in Daniel 11 quite a few times. Um, so that's going to be in... Uh, Okay, this is the other one. So this is Daniel 11, verse 10. I think the Hebrew word shows up more, but I'm just looking at the English word. Um, yeah, so this is going to be um, Daniel. It's going to be referred to as translated as the word strength in Daniel eleven thirty one. It's going to be fortress in verse 7 and 10. It's going to be translated as forces. In 1138 and uh, most as as the word most in Daniel 1139 and strengthen in Daniel 11.1. Okay, so we had it in um, at the beginning of this chapter. So it shows up in Daniel 11 a few times, this Hebrew word, which is 4581. Now, do we apply the rule of first mention with this word? Um, well, we can apply it with any word. Yeah. So you're going to have it first mentioned where? Judges 6.26. Okay. So Judges 6.26. Okay. There it is. Translated as rock. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God. Upon the top of this rock or fortress, I guess, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice. Okay, so that's going to be in the story of Gideon. So we've studied that in detail. These are going to be um, these different bullocks, right? There's going to be the second bullock of seven, of seven years old. Right. So you got um, you got a first bullock and then a second bullock of seven years old. Build an, op- an altar on the unto the Lord that God upon the top of the rock in the ordered place. And take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which thou shalt cut down. Right. So. Um, so what what would that give us as information about this fortress? Well, in this situation, the application for fortress had been that this was something that the king of the south was viewing as important, needing to be taken, as important, needing to be removed. Because if you control the fortress, if you control the rock as it is, you're controlling the the overall um, shall we say importance of the nation now in this in this situation from Daniel, the rock of the United States has always been the Constitution, okay. So when I'm looking at this and comparing it with judges, when the king of the south seeks to control the rock of the king of the north, isn't that the same as setting aside the Constitution? Okay, so that's verse 7. You're saying they shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. Right. Right. And so this is... Basically, getting rid of the Constitution. Right. Okay. And that's going to be, uh, out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate. So if we're saying that this is of the branch of the roots here and his standing up in his estate, wouldn't this refer to a president of the United States? But in this case, uh, this president is is um 
entering into the fortress of the king of the north, right? So that's the United States. So this is a king of the south. So this is a globalist president. Right. Is that how you look at that? That's that's the position I, I would be taking, but I would also be using Ezekiel twenty four twenty five as a support to that. Okay, so Ezekiel twenty four twenty five. <clears throat> and thou son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their strength, their joy of their glory, and the desire of their eyes, that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in that day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear with thine ears. So we know that this is actually the, the sanctuary, right? Right. Okay. Now, it is interesting um, that if you look at this verse, um, and you compare it to uh, to Leviticus 26, verse um, 18, um, I will break the pride of your power. So you see that there, 1347 and 5797? Okay. And then you look at this verse here. Um, so, is, am I looking at the right verse? Am I thinking the right thing? I might be wrong here. Um, this might be in the other part of it here. Just hang on a second. Let me go back there. Because this pride of your power is referred to in Ezekiel as well. So, let me go back. Leviticus. So Leviticus 26, verse um, 19. Break, in verse 19, I'll break the pride of your power. So that's going to be... Um, And I might be thinking of the wrong verse, uh, but it's going to talk about this, the same thing. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, it's Ezekiel 24, but it's in verse 21. So it says, speak unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the excellency of your strength. So those are the same words, Ga'an and Oz, right? The pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, which your soul pitieth, and your sons and your daughters whom you have left fall by the sword. So when you get to verse 25, um, it's not going to say the pride of your power here, but it's going to be talking about the same thing, right? The sanctuary that's removed. So how do we take this pride of your power, which refers to the captivity of Manasseh being in, in 677 B.C.? How do we equate this with these verses here talking about the destruction of the sanctuary in 586? What's the connection between the first seven times and the fourth seven times? I guess is a simple question. To make it more obvious. The progression of the desolation and the progression of the destruction. Okay. Yeah. So so when he talks about the sanctuary, the excellency of your strength, and he says, well, this is the pride of your power. Well, we say, well, the kingship is the pride of your power. That's in 677. But Ezekiel 24 is not talking about the first seven times. It's talking about the fourth, right? Correct. Destruction of the city and the sanctuary. And um, so they're going to use a different word for strength, right? And, and they're not going to use pride in, in verse 25, right? So they're going to use joy, glory, 
but it's still going to talk about the desire of your eyes, the same term. So it's going to, it's going to parallel the pride of your power with, um, now this word is the word strength. Now it's ma'oz. So notice that the word strength is oz. And if you hear it's ma'oz, so all they've done is they've added, um, a mem to the beginning of the word, right? So they have this, the, the mem or mem added to it. And, um, and they, they're not going to have this word, which is excellency, get on. So that's the pomp or pride. I'll take from them their strength, their ma'az, right? The joy of the glory, the desire of the eyes, that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters. So it's going to include all of these things. That is, it's going to include the sanctuary. It's going to ex include the pride of power, the kingship. It's going to include the children. That is, in this section, you can see that all of the four seven times are included. OK, so this is this is an argument I've made before where people have taken this pride of your power. They looked it up. So they're trying to follow Miller's rules. And they say, well, that's just dealing with the sanctuary It has nothing to do with the kingship. But we can see that all of these things are included. The sanctuary, the kingship. Um. Everything that your that your eyes desire, your sons and your daughters, all of these things are going to be taken away from you. So now we're saying this strength is referring to the Constitution, right? That's what you're arguing here as well. That's correct. Yeah. So. Um, now, as a as a further comparative. If we were to look at Jeremiah 16, 19, I think we could compare where Jeremiah's faith is versus the faith that Israel had in the kingship and America has had in their constitution. Okay. Okay, say that again. Okay. <clears throat> we are looking at the Constitution as being the basically the fortress or the strength of the United States, correct? Yes. And we are looking that with Israel that they were looking that the strength of their nation was in their kingship. The pride of their power, right? Yeah. But if we're looking at Jeremiah 16, 19, Jeremiah places the strength in the proper context. Okay. So okay. if we, you look at yeah. 1619, we have a very different situation. Yeah, so you're saying in, uh, yeah, in Jeremiah? 1619. 19. So we got, um, O Lord, my strength, my fortress, and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. So the true strength is in God. He's the true fortress. Correct. Okay. He's now, the true rock. Yeah. Okay. So you'll see here, because um, this is Dan, um, Angela was referring to call and study. Right. We can see from August 11th, 1840 to April 19th, 1844 is 1300. 
and 47 days, right? So uh, when we looked at Leviticus 26 and we dealt with the pride of the power in verse 19, you can see that 1347 is the word pride, right? And that's going to go. Now, he's going to apply that then to July 18, 2020. And you're going to have the 186 days. So 1347 minus 186 or plus 186 is 1533. So is this 1347 important in the context of what we're talking about? Like this is going back to Leviticus 26, mind you. It's not in Daniel chapter 11, but it's, it's connected, right? We're connected with this, with our history. So 1347 already a date it's that's november of 2000 symbol. what's that it's establishing another symbol okay so yeah so it's putting another symbol in our line that that we haven't we haven't um marked in the line but if so if we go back here so how am i going to do this uh go here so if we go from July 18, 2020, now we have July 18, 21 here, but we're going to go from July 18, 2020. This is going to be, bring us back, uh, to November 9th, 2016. So we'd have to put this in here. I'm just going to copy this. in here okay. down at the bottom yep. so we put this down here and we would just say we'd have to use one of these things here This is going to go to July 18, 2020. And that's going to be, um, let's just drop this. This is going to be the word pride, which is 1347, H1347. Okay, so we put that there. What does that tell us? Does that help us in any way? So what what is that? Is that helping us in any way of understanding these lines? What we have here is these way marks. I don't have a direct answer. I see the placement. Okay. Now, we have the date of 11 9 of 16 I recognize the validity of July 18th, but what yeah. refresh my mind? Okay, so so we have here. This is the ele- the election of Trump to July 18th. All right. Now we're also going to have the 186 days to the the 20th day of. So this here. I'm just going to get rid of this. So I'm going to put that July 18th date there and leave it there. Um, And um, I'm going to, this July 18th, 2020, I'm going to leave there. But I'm going to place here uh, January 20th. 
um, 2021, right? So I guess I could just leave it like that. Okay, so we got January 2021. That's going to be uh, 186 days. So I can just write 186 in there. Right? Right. So that's from Colin's study. Now, remember, of course, his study is connected to this study because even though we're not in this particular study looking at the presidents of the United States, they're showing up in this line. Okay, so they're showing up here. And so that's going to be 1,533 days. So we have this this way mark um, from this period to this period. Now, how many years is that? From... Uh, the, the 20th day of the first month in 2011 to the 20th day of the first month in 2021. Well, it's 10 years. Okay, it's 10 years. And we have that number, right? That's going to be this, which is um, not this one, but H36. Five, three. And so what was that word that was translated as? What was it translated as? What is the word? 3653? Three. Do you remember? We talked about it. So we have 10 years there represented in that line. Okay, so with this, we have the 1533 and we have these 10 years. Yeah. And it's in Daniel 11, verse, um, verse 7. It's the word estate, right? Okay. Okay. So if he stands up in his estate, when does he do that? According to this line. So we're going to put this line here. We're going to put the word estate. That's Daniel 7, uh, 11, verse 7. He's going to stand up in his estate. So some, so who comes in January 20th, 2021? Well, that's Biden replacing Trump. And indeed, he stood up in his estate because he was an imposter. Still is. Right. Okay. So, so can we fit that into this history? That, that we're in the history of the Sunday law in these events since, since September 11th which is what we learned in the book of Judges. So if we look at that verse, in verse 7, out of the branch of her roots, so that is the her, this is, um, the her is the daughter of the king of the south. So out of the branch of her roots, she'll stand up, Shall one stand up in his estate? So in whose estate? And he shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north. So does that happen with Biden? Technically, yes. Okay. So, so we could apply it there. I'm not saying that that's because there's other ways to look at this, but we could say that when he stands up in his estate, the, 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 his estate is the king of the north's estate, right? Which in this case is Biden, or Biden standing up in his estate. The estate here is the king of the north's estate, which 
um, and he shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, shall prevail against them, and, or shall deal against them and shall prevail. Right? So this is uh, this word deal is very broad meaning word um, that is to do or to make against them. And, and the question is, who's to them and shall prevail? So so this is the king of the south. That is, this is the branch of the root. So this would be a president of the United States. Be, but he's a branch of the roots. Now, though the one op- option is that it is Biden. Um, but, but it could be the, the seventh king as well. That is his estate referring to the one who comes into power on January 21st, 2021. So that's also a possibility, but it's these 10 years that I would say, well, it's just going to give us this, this date. So what we're doing is we're taking the word estate and we're adding it to, uh, the other ones that is four wins. So the four wins plus a state is going, because we have this all the way back from this, um, this uh, 8,000 uh, and nine days is going to start at, um, the end of this 10, 10 year war, right? This 341 day war. So you have 809 days and the 809 come from adding 702 plus, which is the four to the word wins, 7307. So you add that to the word estate and you get that whole span of time to January 20th, 2021 which Colin has already marked on our lines, right? And is connected with the pride, which is Trump. And so the estate that he's standing up in is going to be Trump's estate, right? That is, Trump is the king of the North in this context, right? He's the United States, but he's the president of the Republican Party, which is the North. The Democratic Party is the king of the South. So we can start to take this North and South and look at it as Republican and Democrat in this context, right? All right. So, so I think it, it, it definitely brings us to this history. So we can say it's the history of the Sunday law, but it's all of this preamble to the Sunday law, right? It's all of these events leading to this Sunday law history. And because we can place these dates connected with these Hebrew numbers. And so this 1533 days from November 9th, 2016 uh, to January 20th, 2021, 1533 days, uh, we recognize that we can do this. Now, um, so we got all these November 9ths. Right. So, uh, so from November 9th, 1533 days to November 9th. Um, yeah. So we have all these connections. These November 9ths connect with 9-11s in various different ways. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure exactly how we can, we're going to have to look at this tomorrow, of course. But do, do, are we starting to make progress here? in understanding these passages as applied to our time. That this would go back to what we talked about, the rights. What's that? I said we're starting to make progress. Okay. And, And this goes back to what we were talking about with the rights, which I was sort of opposed to, right? That this agreement is, is addressing rights. Correct? Right. Exactly. Okay. Because that's what ends up, uh, ends up occurring here. So, um, so when we look at this verse, um, just gotta get back here. 
Um, so the word uh, agreement, this is actually, and you look at the word make, which means um, uh, to advance, right? So you could say, uh, the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to advance rights. These would be human rights. But we can also see that there is a league going on. So, so that league is, in a sense, it's an agreement that they're not advancing human rights in that history. Right? That wasn't what was happening. But we can see when we make an application to our time, we can do this. It's not negating the, the historical uh, application at all. It's just showing another layer because this is about an agreement or a league historically. They're, they're not advancing anybody's human rights. You know, they're not dealing with LGBTQ and, and all that stuff and BLM. But in, in our history, it, it is. But it still is about coming into this fortress, right? But that's going to happen. So this is the history earlier from 9-11. When we get to verse 7, it's going to come up to the history where the United States is defeated by the globalists. And so when we get to verse 8, and shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and gold, he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So we have to look at this. Um, obviously, in our time, it's not so much about spans of time. It's about the symbols that are here. So that 8141, the Shana, the year, like Rosh Hashanah, right, Shana, um, that's going to be a period of time in our lines that's going to go from... Um, uh, yeah, that's going to go to the December 25th, 2023 from 9-11. So we can see that, that that's the period of time in which this league has begun. It begins at 9-11 and it continues to December 25th, 2023. So we're not, we're not predicting a, an event on that date, just to the symbol of the Sunday law. Okay, so so hopefully that that helps people kind of it's helping me to sort this through. And uh, any final comments before we close with prayer? Not yet. Okay. Well, let's pray. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we've had here this morning. And um, we pray that you can help us as we continue to study these things and present them. You know, Lord, there, there's much still that we don't understand. And so we just ask for your wisdom. Uh, be, be watching over each person. May your angels watch over us. May you bring us together again to study your word. It is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.